Man, it is so good to be home. Good to see you. It is so good to be home. I want to thank you guys for allowing Robbie and I to take some time off. We were a little tired. Matter of fact, we was meeting with the leaders at one time. I don't remember what we were doing, but uh, uh, I told them that, you know, uh, I had taken the first week off, and one of the leaders, I don't remember who it was, said, you seem like you're in a great mood. I said, I'm in a good mood every day. No, you haven't. <laughs> so apparently, I needed to take some time off, and I appreciate you all allowing that to happen. We have some amazing leaders in our church. You all give it up for them. Pastor Corey, Brother Jimmy, man, thank you guys. Man, you know, I know that I can leave this church, man, and I know when I come back, it'll be in great, great hands. Most of the time, it's better, praise God, sometimes, right? Man, I'm glad, grateful to be back. Hey, we are kicking off a new season, a season that's coming up uh, that we're in right now. I love the month of August because the month of August kind of, we're saying goodbye to summer. Some of you parents said amen, right? We ready for them babies to go back to school, right? But it's also a great time that we get to come back, man, and just start refocusing and refreshing and get coming back to uh, kind of getting things back on a normal schedule. Here's an interesting thought. I don't know if y'all thought about this, but in the month of uh, August and September, which is harvest season, do y'all know, understand that this is a fall, that more people come to know Jesus Christ in those months than any other time? Isn't that interesting? It's just a season that we're coming into. And what I love about it is that's when we kick off, uh, as we're going to do tomorrow, tomorrow morning, we kick off 21 days of prayer. Everybody say amen. Now, 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 let me say this. First of all, you should be praying every day already. Come on, right? Come on now, right? I said, Pastor Mike, I pray every day. Okay, good, good. All right, but for those of you who don't, look, we do 21 days of prayer where we focus our prayer as a group. And many times in the Bible, um, the leader, the prophet would call the church together, gather them together for a time of prayer. And so that's what we're going to be doing over the next 21 days. This is what it's going to look like. The doors of our church will be open at seven, or 6 a.m., all right, and we'll start prayer at 6 a.m. It will run from 6 to 7, I promise you. I know you hear this. I promise you, you will be done by 7 o'clock. We always finish by 7. Many of you were here last year. That we will finish at 7 a.m. So I know a lot of you have jobs and you need to go. And so you go, if you're not, I know some people work way earlier than that. They got to be at work, you know, 4 o'clock. I was just talking to somebody this morning. They go to work at 4 a.m. We will be broadcasting it live on Facebook. Miss Hannah, uh, our social media director, will have that up and running at 6 a.m. You just log into. Uh, your Facebook account, find us or whatever, and um, and you'll be able to uh, gather with us. And one of the things that lo we love about that, what we want you to do is interact with that. So if you have a prayer or you feel like God's speaking to you about something, send it across to us, and then what we'll do is we'll we'll communicate that to those that are going to be here uh, in the live service. All right? We'll have worship. We will uh, be praying. We're going to pray for our community. We're going to pray for our church. We're going to pray for the direction for the rest of the year. And just a time that we come together and say, man, it's time for us to just re-engage, refocus, and refresh. How many is going to be here? Praise God. I just called you out. I, didn't. I was like, oh, man. Does that mean I'm committed? <laughs> Praise God. Well, Pastor Mike will be here. We're actually going to be changing up our entire schedule during the week, our office hours and everything, so that, so that we'll be here. And um, our staff that's there uh, will be here as well. Um, and so, man, we want it to be a season, and that's what we're really dealing with, is it's a season of us really coming together to draw nearer and, and draw closer to God. Because we know, man, vacations happen, life happens, and it's really easy to just kind of get, you know, kind of get outside of, you know, what God's purpose and His plan for us. It's a time for us to really, uh, many of you all got the shirt on, I see in pursuit, one, two, there's several in pursuit. It's a time for us to pursue His presence, amen? I mean, a lot of y'all don't know what that means, and, and hang around with us a little bit, um, you'll find out, because we want you to press into his presence. But here's the deal. People will only press in to their level of comfort. You guys can write that one down. That's, people will only press in to their level of comfort, and, and that's really kind of the direction that we want to go over the next couple of weeks um, is helping people to grow closer to the Father because people, and you guys know this for yourself, you won't grow closer to somebody or something unless you know more about them, amen? I mean, if, if, if they're kind of strange, right, you'd be like, ah, we're going to keep a distance, right? Well, people do the same thing with God. 
People do the same exact thing with our Heavenly Father. Things that we don't understand, things that we are unsure of, myth and uh, 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 misunderstanding of who He is, will we'll, we'll, we'll strong arm and say, okay, I don't get that, so I'm going to push you back over here. Right? Uh, I have people do that all the time. They'll reject God um, for things that are not even in the Bible, uh, misconceptions, ideas, thoughts that they've heard about. Uh, how many have ever heard this one? Um, uh, God only helps those that help themselves, brother. Praise the Lord. That's not in the Bible. And that's a misconception. That's a myth. It's not true. Well, I'm just going to, I'll come to church once I get my life all together. Every, once I get everything kind of worked out in my life, then, then I'll come to church, right? Because we think, man, that that's what God wants. We have, see, the Bible has a problem, or the Christians, really Christianity, has a marketing problem. It really does. It has a marketing problem because the package that sometimes that it's marketed in can lead to a lot of misconceptions and myths. And so over the next four weeks, that's really kind of where we're, what we're going to be um, dealing with is, is dealing with some of these misconceptions, dealing with some of these myths that cause us, that really I'm hoping that will change it so that it'll cause us to want to pursue God even more over the next, the rest of your year, right? I want you to open your Bibles up to passages of Scripture, uh, Acts chapter 2. All right, and Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 2 and Acts 13. Hold your place in Acts 13, and we're going to come back to that later, but uh, uh, we'll act, we're going to start in um, Acts chapter 2. So today we're going to kick off this brand new series, we've, uh, as we said earlier, um, called This Is That. Look at your neighbor and say, this? Come on, play along with me. I love it when you play along, praise God. Say, this is that. Not that. I said, not that. But this is that. I'm going to get this in your head. You'll be like, man, that's good. be like, there's an old song I was listening to. It's an old, old, some of y'all old school folks will know that. That This is that, spoken by the prophet Joel. Y'all remember that one? This is that. Spoken, hold up. Pastor Don, of course, would know that. Praise God. Right? <laughs> Pastor Don knows the good stuff, man. That's a good song, man. I was actually trying to find it online so I can listen to it. And then it brought back all the, all the old stuff that I used to listen to back in the day. Um. But anyhow, what we're going to be doing is dispelling some of these myths and these misconceptions to help us grow closer and to be the men and women that God has for us to be. Now, we already know, most of us know, that over the last several weeks, actually several months since the year has begun, we have really been dealing with, you know, trying to take what happens here on Sunday morning and do what with it? Take it home, right? So we've been talking about the Spirit-filled family. And so I want to kind of piggyback on that this morning as we kick off talking about these different messages that we're going to talk about, all right? So we know that, so I want to set it up for for a moment to kind of see where we're going. So go back to Jesus. He dies on the cross of Calvary, right? He's dead for three days. And then for the next 40 days, Jesus kind of does this thing where he's popping out of walls. He's showing up to thousands of people, doing all this great ministry stuff. And then on the uh, mount of what they call the Mount of Transfiguration, he talks to the disciples and he tells the disciples, hey, I'm out of here. I'm leaving you, but I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. When I leave you, uh, I'm gonna, I want you to stay in Jerusalem. I want you to hang out here because I've got something for you. It's going to help you fulfill the call and the purpose that I'm calling you to, right? And so it's John 14. Matter of fact, John 14, John 15, and John 16 Beautiful passages. Those all happened at the Lust Supper. You all seen the picture, right? With the, you know, they kind of look a little feminine. Some of them, right? Where Jesus in the middle, and all this time we got somebody laying her head over there like that and doing all that thing, right? That 14, 15, and 16 of the Book of John is really Jesus talking about his last days on this earth and what he's going to be doing and, and what to expect. And most of it is talking about Holy Spirit. All right, John 14 is one of my favorite verses that we talk about quite a bit here because it's in John 14 that we're introduced to the Holy Spirit by the way of Jesus. Because Jesus is talking to the disciples and he says, hey, stay here in Jerusalem. And when I leave, go to Jerusalem, stay here, and the, 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 uh, the, the, the comforter, the word comforter is what he uses, will come. And he says, you know him for he's with you. But he says, stay in Jerusalem and he'll be, come on, help me out. He'll be in you. And that's what we believe here at Epic Life. I believe that when you get saved, we're going to talk more about this, but when you get saved, Holy Spirit is with you. You can't get saved and have a relationship with Christ outside of Holy Spirit drawing you to Daddy. We'll talk about that in a minute, right? 
But in order to live out the life that God has for us, you need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You cannot do it out of the flesh. I said you cannot do it out of the flesh. And that's where we get burned out. That's where we become discouraged because we're trying to do something that our flesh is saying, "Uh uh-uh, I ain't doing it. I don't want to do it, right? Passage of Scripture that comes to mind is the flesh is, or the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Why? Because the flesh doesn't want to live a supernatural life. But we were created to be. You were created. We talked about this a few weeks ago, right? You were created to live in the supernatural, right? So Jesus does this. So on the 50th day, all of this stuff is going on. Jesus is now off the earth. Now he says he's going to return the very place that he was taken up, which I believe, church, can happen at any moment. I believe Jesus can come back tomorrow, man. I believe the signs and all the wonders and all that stuff that's going on. Man, we are living. I believe that we are living in the last days. It doesn't mean we kick our feet up and watch Oprah, right, or or whoever. But it means that we need to be vigilant in reaching people for the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? So on the 50th day, this is what happens, right? So on the 50th day, what happens is now they're all gathered in the upper room. The Holy Spirit is poured down into these 120 people that were in the upper room, right? And this is where we're going to pick up the story. This is where we're going to really get the meat and the context for what we're talking about over the next four weeks. Acts chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. Watch this. Just like here in this world. So so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? It's the same thing in the body of Christ today. It's the same thing with the world today. When people find out you're a Christian, they become amazed and perplexed. For some of you, you live such a wild, wicked, kind of crazy lie that when your homeboys and homegirls from the past find you today, they go, they are amazed and perplexed. And they're looking at you going, how in the world can you be this person? I remember what you used to do. Right? Amen. How many of y'all got friends like that, right? I I agree. Amazed. And perplexed and most people when they think or see of real Christianity looks like this too they're amazed and perplexed and they're asking that same question whatever could this mean whatever does this what in the world happened to you right and then you got that other group of people right you got the other one look at verse 13 that's very low I don't know why that got so low but I'll read it to you since you can't read it. hopefully you're following along in your Bible app you can follow along with us Verse 13 says, others mocking said, they are filled or full of new wine. Now they're saying, hey, man, these dudes have been hitting the bottle a little hard. Right? Maybe you put Bud Light on there for some of y'all, Jack Daniels, maybe a little tequila, whatever. But, man, I love it. You're always going to receive criticism or be mocked what you don't understand. I want to say that again. You will mock, we as human nature in our lives, we will mock, we will tease, we will make fun of, and we will criticize what we don't understand. And there are some here this morning that when we start talking about the Holy Spirit, you instantly go into a critical mode and you begin to criticize because you don't understand or you don't don't know what this stuff means. And so what we want to do is we want to defunct some of that, right? Look at what Peter does. Peter does exactly that, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my word. And they said, hey, listen up. For these are not drunk as you suppose. Since it is only the third hour. In other words, they're saying, look, it's only three o'clock in the morning, man, bar hadn't even opened yet, or three o'clock in the afternoon, the bar hadn't even opened yet. These guys are not drunk like you think they are. But what? Watch this. But, everybody say, but, this, say it in, this is that. Say it again. This is that. What is it? But this is that, which was spoken by the prophet Joel. See, I love dispelling myths. As a pastor, one of my favorite things to do is to sit down with people and reveal the gospel, reveal the truth of God's word. See, we'll hear a scripture, and we run with the scripture, but we don't take the context around the scripture. And so then what happens is we become a bad packaging deal, and so now people see this, or we hear something, and instead of studying out the truth of God's word. So one of the things I love to do as a pastor is dispel myths and, and reveal what God's word truly says, the whole truth of God's word. Amen? 
I love that. So that's what we're going to do. Over the next four weeks, we're going to look at four areas that I feel have a lot of misconceptions, a lot of myths attached to them. So today, of course, we're going to talk about who? Holy Spirit. Thank you, Pastor Corey, listening. Number two, next week, we're going to look at praise and worship. Come on, we're going to talk about, hey, man, do we pray? Do we worship like this, like this? Do we do hymns? What do we do? All right, we're going to uh, knock out some misconceptions and uh, stuff there. Uh, week three, one of my favorite ones, I can't wait to do this one, is we're going to talk about healing. How many of y'all know the great physician is still in the house, man? He is still Jehovah Je uh, Rapha, man. He is the Lord that heals my kapha. Come on now. That's old school right there, Pastor Don, right there. Heal my kapha, Jehovah Rapha. And then the last one, I could actually make this in probably an eight-week series if I wanted to. But the last week, we're going to talk about some misconceptions, misconceptions and some myths attached to prosperity. And what does prosperity mean? What does it look like for the body of Christ to walk in abundance and walk with prosperity so let's let's talk about real quick who holy spirit isn't who he's not okay number one he is not an it look to your neighbor and tell him he is not an it holy spirit is not an it holy spirit is he he is the very presence of the father sent down from heaven down to us Holy Spirit is not an it. Number two, you've heard me say this. If you've heard me say it once, you've heard me say it 20 times. He is not, come on, somebody. Thank you very much. Somebody follow my notes. He's not weird. Pastor Mike's weird. Pastor Cor <laughs> Pastor Corey's weird. Man. <laughs> but he's not. Holy Spirit's not weird. Don't let the way people act make the decision for who Holy Spirit is for you. See, many people like the power of the Holy Spirit. See, it's, again, it's a packaging problem. See, many people love to see the results of the Holy Spirit. They love to talk about the Holy Spirit. Might even like the power of the Holy Spirit. They just don't like the package that they've seen it in. Where they're rolling on the floor and acting weird and crazy and all that stuff. That's not who he is. The Holy Spirit is not weird. So then who is he? Who is Holy Spirit? How do we look at his life and go, man, this is the Holy Spirit. So number one, follow along with me in your notes. Number one, this is who Jesus says he is. He is my inner voice. He's that voice that's speaking to you. Some of you right now, Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Through worship, you are being spoken to. Some, think, some of you think it's your voice that you're hearing but it's not. It's the Holy Spirit's voice that's talking to you, that's guiding you, that's leading you. Jesus said that those who know him would hear his voice, right? How? Through Holy Spirit. Because remember, I'm gonna, I'll say that in a minute. So what does Jesus say? John 16, 8 through 11. Look here. And when he has come, who? Holy Spirit. Notice what Jesus says. Those very first four words, five words. When he has come. Not when it has come. When he has come, who? He will convict the world of sin. And of righteousness and of judgment and of sin because they do not believe in me. Now he's talking about himself. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. I need to reemphasize that. You will what? Come on, y'all. See who no more. So Jesus isn't here. Amen. I need you guys to get this. See, we think Jesus is still here. Oh, Jesus, help me. Oh, Jesus, help me. Okay? Jesus isn't here. We were talking about this in corporate prayer. You guys play along. Where is Jesus? No, if you're in corporate prayer, don't answer. Where is Jesus? Right hand of the Father. You were at corporate prayer. He said, no, it wasn't. <laughs> he sits with the Father. He's done. He's completed what he needed to do. And he tells the disciples before he's out of here, look, I'm sending someone to you because I'm leaving. But I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'll send another. And that's what we find out here, that he sends the Holy Spirit. 
verse 11, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God, watch this, calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. This means that you cannot declare Jesus as your Lord and your Savior unless the Holy Spirit has drawn you to that. So he speaks to you, and he draws you, and he's talking to you, and he says, hey, this is what you need. You need salvation. You need to live a different life. He convicts us of that stuff, right? Well, that's the Holy Spirit that's doing it. And what does he want you to do? He wants you to accept Jesus' free gift of grace and salvation for your life. And that's what happened. He comes in, he speaks to you. Right? It's not like, man, we, we think, man, that it's Jesus that's coming in, and, we, and there's such a misconception, a misunderstanding of how God is operating on this earth. God and Jesus are not here. They gave us Holy Spirit. You can study this, man. Go study this on your own. It's good stuff. Number two is that he's my counselor. He's my counselor. You need wisdom? It's Holy Spirit that will counsel you. It's Holy Spirit that will teach you. You're going to see that in a minute. But John 14, 26. But the helper. Who? The helper, the Holy Spirit. He defines it right there, verse 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Did you see that? Whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. See, that counselor is wonderful, man, because when you don't know what decision you need to do, if you don't know where to go, the counselor will bring counsel to you. And he does it without condemnation and out guilt. He doesn't sit there and go, you worthless piece of junk. I can't believe you're even asking that question. He goes, man, this is what you need to do. Go this direction. Go this direction. I know you're hurting right now, but trust me in this. Do this. Do that. He gives us good counsel. 1 John 2.27, by the anointing which you've received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. You realize you don't have to go to cemetery school to get a degree in God. You have the counselor. You have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it was taught to you, you will abide in him. In who? Holy Spirit. So he's our counselor. He will counsel. He'll give you the wisdom that you need. And number three, he's my teacher. He's my teacher, John 16, 13. However, when he, who? The spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. This is key. He'll not speak about his own authority. He's not a, that tells you that he's not separate. He's not a separate entity towards God and Christ, that he will speak on whose authority? God, that's right. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. Hear from who? Heaven. He's the pipeline to teach us, and he will tell you things to come. I love that. There are things that are not even written yet that Holy Spirit will reveal to you. Isaiah 30 and 20, And though and through the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore. Why? Because it's spiritual. But your eyes shall see your teachers. Spirit-filled, golly, praise God. And finally, this is one I want to tell you right here. He's your friend. He is my friend. John 14, 16. And I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another comforter again. And I brought this out of the Amplified. I want you to see this. Counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and standby. I love this, man, because it actually comes from a word called paraclete or paracletus. And paraclete means helper. It's where we get the, that's why my wife is my paraclete, right? The Holy Spirit is my paraclete, my helper. The, the picture that it draws together for us as believers is that helper where you pick up one end of the log that you have to carry, and the Holy Spirit grabs the other end. That's powerful. See, we're not left alone, isolated by ourselves, trying to figure this thing out. Jesus said, man, I'm going to send someone to you. And you'll not be just an eye. That's why the Holy Spirit is so, is so important. I love that paraclete. One that comes alongside, a helper. 2 Corinthians 13 and 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. And watch this. The communion of Holy Spirit. The word communion is just like us as friends. It's a friendship. It's relationship. I have communion with Holy Spirit. I have a friendship with Holy Spirit. Spirit, man, he's not up there with the billy club. Some of y'all feel like the Holy Spirit is beating you up, and it's not him beating you up. 
Because that goes against even what we've just talked about. It goes completely against everything we, we believe and everything we've, we've been teaching. He's not up there. He's your friend. The Bible says there is one that sticks closer to a brother. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. He'll stick closer to a brother, right? See, there's so many misconceptions. God and Jesus are in heaven. They are not here. And this is why we need Holy Spirit in our life. Holy Spirit is God. The, the word spirit comes from that word pneuma, pneumatic. It's air. It's a breath of fresh air. It's God's spirit, God breathing on us and into us for us to come alive as believers. It's more than just, um, just being, it's like empowerment to live out the life that you and I were created to live. I had someone ask me one time, why do you talk about the Holy Spirit all the time? Pastor Mike, you seem like you talk about the Holy Spirit more than you talk about God and Jesus. No, I don't. But the, there is emphasis on the Holy Spirit because he's here. He's the one that I need to live out the life that God has created me to live. God is on his throne. Jesus is up in heaven. He did what he needed to do so that I could be a Christian, that I could be saved and my life to be transformed. But for me to walk it out, I need Holy Spirit. So here's the thing about the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve him. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. This is what I mean. Not responding to him, not following him, and yes, even not obeying him is what the Bible tells, the Old Testament uh, term is quenching, when we quench the Spirit. It means that the Spirit of God is moving and active in our life, but we reject Him, we turn Him down. We're like, turn that volume down. Go love on that person. I don't want to love that person. Go forgive them. Oh, don't want to forgive that person. We're quenching the Holy Spirit. Don't do that because you'll miss out on the life you were created to live. Now, if you have done that in your past, let me tell you what you do. It's so simple. Go back to that moment. Repent, do what He told you to do, and move on from it. Don't hang out there, right? Don't hang out there. Ephesians 4.30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed by the day of redemption. You've been sealed by the Spirit. And we need that Spirit in our life, so don't question. The bottom line is that God, the Holy Spirit, He is good and He helps and He leads us into the life the Father has for us. There's a passage of Scripture that says, uh, Walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That word walk is an interesting word. It doesn't mean to walk like physically walking like we are right now, right? It means to look at the path that's been set before you by Holy Spirit and walk that path. We think it's walk, like i got to walk in spirit, like i got to speak in tongues every day, and, and i got to, you know, like do, do a jig or something. That's walking in the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't. It means to live out the path that's been set before you as a believer, as a new. It's, you live in your purpose. It's living the purpose that God has for you. That's what it means to walk in the Spirit. Three simple prayers that you can get the Holy Spirit to work and to live the life that you're created to live. These are three prayers that I pray every day. Many of you know I've shared this story, but that before my feet hit the ground, me and Daddy are already having conversations. And I'm not trying to pat myself in the back and like, look how spiritual I am. It's, it's not that. It's that I know that I need this Holy Spirit in my life in order to fulfill what God has done in my life and in order for me to do what I need to do. To be the husband, to be a father, to be a grandfather, to be a pastor, I need Holy Spirit's guidance and power in my life. So here are, here are three things you can do and three things you can pray in order to see the Holy Spirit begin to operate in your life as I believe number one here's the first one Holy Spirit show me Holy Spirit show me you're asking the Holy Spirit re reveal yourself to me and more importantly watch this reveal me to me see I think sometimes we can lie to ourselves, right there are things that are going on there's issues that we've got to deal with but we don't know that they're there in our hearts. And the, we need the Holy Spirit to come in and just kind of shine a, shine a flashlight down on our life. I've talked to many brothers in this, man, and when they don't know what's going on, I'll say, pray this with me. Holy Spirit, they'll say, Holy Spirit, shine your light on my heart. And it's amazing to watch what happens to them because their eyes, I was like, what happened? I just heard Holy Spirit say this. I'm like, that's it. Let's deal with that. And he's there for you guys. Ezekiel chapter 36, 26 through 27. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. What does that mean? He'll take the heart that's, that, that you can't mold, that you won't listen to, that's not soft, it's not pliable. And he says, I'll give you a heart of flesh. How? Through the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the heart of flesh is pliable. It can be spoken to. It can be ministered to. It can be taught. It can be searched. It's willing to, to allow exposure so that daddy can do a work in their life. Right? Anybody get something from this this morning? Come on. All right. Psalms 139, 23, and 24. I posted this on social media a couple days ago. But, man, I was just meditating on the scripture because it's so powerful. It is the key to pursuit. 
and it's search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me. Know my anxieties. How many of y'all, don't raise your hand, but how many of y'all deal with anxiety? How many of y'all are anxious all the time? How many of y'all got pressures on you? Look at what he says here. Search me, O God, and know my heart. What is he telling me? Show me why I'm anxious. Show me why I'm dealing with depression. Show me why I'm, I have these anxieties in my heart and in my life. Because generally, man, there's something there that God says, man, I need to pull that out of you. And the only way to do that is to shine his light on it. So that a grace and mercy and truth can come in and cleanse that garbage out of us. Amen? Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I think some of us get scared right here because we're saying, God, we, God, is there things in me that's pulling me away from you? Number two, the second thing you can pray, Holy Spirit, change me. Holy Spirit, change me. This is a tough one. This is a tough one. I'm not going to lie to you. Because once he shows you, you're going to have to be bold. You'll have to be courageous. Because he'll reveal things in your life. He said, man, you're going to have to deal with this, okay? And now we've got to have courage and boldness to say, okay, will you change me? You might have to make some decisions. You have to make some choices. Maybe, maybe for some of you, the change you need to make is that you've given your life to the Lord, but you haven't been baptized yet. And God said, now I want you to make this. This is what I want you to do. For some of you, men, you've been baptized, but you haven't received the spirit baptism. And God says, there's leaders in here. I know that you've not received the, spirit of the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet. And you're wondering what's missing. And God said, this is the change that needs to happen. This is the direction I need you to go. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 through 18 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where who? Come on, who? The Spirit of the Lord is. There is liberty. But we all with unveiled faith beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image. Whose image? The image of our Father. His image. From glory to glory just by, as by the Spirit of the Lord. See, the Holy Spirit will change you. The Holy Spirit will transform you. But our part is that we've got to be willing enough to step into that place. It might be a little uncomfortable. Come on now. He might say, hey, I don't want you smoking no more. That wasn't a dig. I just happened to look this way, praise God. So if anybody's smoking over there, they're like, great. I came to church and got condemned for smoking. All right. But it might be that God's saying there's changes that have to happen in our life. There's a change that he wants to do, and he'll convict us of it. So why? To draw us closer to him. It's not to beat us up. It's not to put a bully stick over us. You just need to straighten up. No, man, change takes boldness. It takes courage to allow Holy Spirit to change us. Number three, as we wrap this up. Number three, Holy Spirit, fill me. Holy Spirit, fill me. I want you all to say this in. Say this with me. Holy Spirit, search me. Holy Spirit, change me. And then finally, Holy Spirit, fill me. Give me everything you have. Well, how many of y'all would say today, man, you have everything that God has for you in your life right now? I agree. We need more. We need all, I want all of him. I want all of him. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. As the band stages quietly, it says, Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dispensation but be filled with the Spirit. That word dispensation is an interesting word. The dispensation means to act as if you do not know God. He wants us, how do we do that? By being filled with the Spirit. Living a life filled with the Spirit is a life filled with God. And that life, no matter what we face, no matter what you're going through, no matter what heartache has come, no matter what stress is on you, no matter what, what, outside people think about you or what's going on in your family and your job and your finances, no matter what is happening. Man, something happens when we invite Holy Spirit into this life to live the life that we were created to, li created to live. No matter what goes on around us, life can be filled with joy. I told you to hold your place at Acts chapter 13, verse 52. Here's the gospel. Here's the good news. Look, Acts 13, 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with Holy Spirit. You know, I, I have a hard time seeing believers who walk around just like with that bitter beer face on, you know? And it's like, like somebody tinkled in their Wheaties, right? And it's like, man, you're a believer. When the Holy Spirit, part of the Holy Spirit, part of the gift of the Holy Spirit is joy. 
We should be living a life of joy. But the reason why we don't live a life of joy is we don't understand the role of Holy Spirit in our life. And we won't allow Him to come into our life. And so our focus is on our flesh. Our focus is on us. It's on our circumstance, our situation, rather than on the relationship that we get to have with Holy Spirit. See, I understand what it looks like to see the myths and the misunderstandings of Holy Spirit. Robin and I have been through churches and to churches, and we've seen the abuse of what Holy Spirit really is about. We've seen the weirdness of it that doesn't make sense. We've seen the packaging that doesn't really represent who God is. We've seen people who thought that somehow because they were filled with the Holy Spirit, right, they were more spiritual and better than we were. And you walk into them and it's like they got this pious, snobby nose stuck up in the air and I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, that's great. Whatever you have, I don't want. And that's not it at all. See, being filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not, it's not about this. It's not about that. It's this. What, look at this last statement. Being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. It makes me better than me. Come on. This is the life that God has for us. And it will, you will struggle, man. I will tell you right now, you will struggle trying to live the life of a believer and with purpose on your own.